Unit E Technologies just recently got an HTC Vive, and they're letting me have pretty much free reign with it, so that's pretty awesome. A lot of people have done a lot of work to reverse engineer that, especially people from like the Lighthouse Redux, Lighthouse Redux group and, uh, well, just a number of other things, OSVR Vive and the Collabra effort. But, as far as I know, nobody's really reverse engineered the protocol to this, the Watchman controller. And, as I found out, for some really good reasons. Now, first I'd like to just touch on some of the things about why the live stream was so cool, and then you'll start to see why the protocol that we were trying to hack was as ridiculous and awesome as it was. So, um, everybody, I went to IAPO with Unity Technologies a couple weeks ago. A friend of mine, Greg Cotton, he had an HTC Vive, and I've played with Oculus, I've played with Gear VR, I've played with a bunch of these things, and they've all been cool, but I never played with an HTC Vive, and as soon as he got it out, and as soon as he showed me those light boxes, I realized the HTC Vive is where the future of VR is. It said very clearly, requires VR capable computer. I realized they haven't met me, have they? Well, I guess they wouldn't, because I'm not really famous or anything, but that's okay, because I'm gonna see if I can get this HTC Vive running. My old little, uh, it's a cheapy Intel i5 Gen 1 laptop. And they emit a flash of light for a specifically coded period of time, and then they sweep a laser this way, and they sweep a, well, another flash, and then they sweep a laser this way. And I used a rolling shutter in order to get a better picture as to what's going on and there is a processor on board that operates at 48 meg I'm sure it actually operates at a much higher, but they will tell you to within 148 millionth of a second when that beam came and hit each one of those little dots. For the, the headset, that's really easy. That's actually already documented and it's documented really, really well. This is not anywhere near that. This has all sorts of crazy, crazy different protocol from any other part of the system, specifically when it's used in wireless mode. And right now there's no messages it's because the, the two lighthouses are off. Um, I can decode all of the light data coming to the headset, but the one thing I can't do, and I can't do it as of right now, so you guys, we're going to just give this a shot and see if we can make it happen, is I can't read the light data from this. So uh, Mindy was nice enough to um, take this controller and put uh, tape over it, over every one of the, uh, the surfaces. So if I go expose this eye right here, see that? Cover the eye, no data. Open the eye, now there's tons of data. Well, the lines are different lengths. It looks like we're dealing with something where these records aren't of stable sizes. Was jiggering up this little uh, AVR right here with a little... Uh, LED on it, and uh, blasting out some light in a pattern that I would be able to uh, to see. Oh, hey, so there's a specific frequency if you care about that. What? It's not two, it's 1.8432. Do they actually know that that's the case? Uh, someone said the guy who wrote the firmware is in the chat room. Hi! <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can see that now when I take this light right here and I hold it up close to the uh, the thing, boom, I start getting the data. One, So maybe A1 is actually not what I think it is. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it turn on for a little bit longer. So one extra cycle, on, off, on, off, on, off. Okay, so right now Mindy here is going to be digging through the firmware with a, uh, with a, a hex editor. Okay, so let's do that. Um, so right now we came into a really interesting data set because we were able to get it to go from both this size right here to this size right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to post this. I'm booping once with the, the LED, waiting 10 mil microseconds, and I'm booping again, data coming through. Ben points out TD remotes operate at 38 kilohertz, and that is deliberately far away. The first part would probably kill you trying to figure it out. Scroll up. Once, one starting after the 0808 and one going in reverse from the end. Oh, okay. Everything after those 0808s is two variable length fields of data. I don't know how to tell the difference between this and this. Well, she's right now opening the binary in a, uh, a tool that can decompile or deassemble it. Ob observations minus calculations. We have our observed measurements, and then we have to calculate uh, what do we expect those measurements to be. 
And if we can do that... I, I need two more bytes, right? Just two. That makes a, a big time thing bite. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that is... Hmm. Which photodiode on here I'm looking at. And then I know that these next two bytes are the time. But how would I write a program that knows that? So it means I'm missing something. I need to know how many LEDs or how many photodiode readings are being read in this message. Read from behind. So you have to parse from the back to figure out how many samples are in it. And you'll come to a point where number of <laughs> sensors hit parsed is not or is equal to number. That's, that's so hokey though. There's got to be a way of knowing. What did he say? Problem you're having is the exact reason why it's byte. Why would you encode something bidirectionally? Why? <laughs> ben just said he's getting flashbacks to writing this code in the first place. <laughs> which is length of time, the distance between time. Length of time, distance between, less than time, distance between time. No, not the last distance. So we have five numbers that will... Um, some of the things that I'm just assuming that he, the reason this is so much more complicated is because these things are using a, a Nordic semi-chip and space is precious. So he did a number of really, really clever things to try to pare down the amount of data that's being sent back. Unfortunately, it means that it's extremely difficult to figure out what he did. Now it has three LEDs, and I can turn each one of them on and off individually. Um, and uh, the, uh, they are right now mapped into different uh, holes on the Vive controller. Now it's going to be running that make over and over and over and over and over again. Um, and so I'm just going to go move that off to another window so I don't have to worry about it and I'm going to be able to tweak it in real time. So I'm going to be able to say change this. So say I want to make it so the duration of the pulse is longer. Right now you see it's 0481. I'm going to say make it 40, whatever those units are. Now if you notice it paused for a split second. Uh, as soon as I save the file uh, it goes and reflashes it and that's it. Um, AVRs are awesome for uh, really fast uh, development cycles, so. Yeah, I know, it is weird. How crazy is that, man? Ben just like must have engineered this thing to be as tight as possible. It's just awesome. Uh, I mean, okay, not really awesome, because if he didn't engineer it to be as tight as possible, we'd be done and I could move on to something else. And it produces a code that makes no sense to me. 24 to 185, which, like, to me that makes sense. Like, 185 times 3, you know, 540-ish, ish, you know, whatever. What's going on there? I'm going to go back to chat now. So that leaves plenty of bits of space left, and knowing Ben, there's no way he's going to be wasting those bits. Uh, come on, guys. Need some more ideas here. Uh, anything you guys want to see. Uh, Daniel, you had some suggestions. Um, variable length quantity on Wikipedia is good for explaining some concepts. Oh, that's really clever! Oh, okay, so what they're doing, if it would be something that would bridge packets, they just separate it out into its own packet and then treat it as a separate piece of data. I mean, I get that it's 2 to the 14. So, uh, let me go back. Uh, VK4, say, um, 2, two VK2, say, um, Oh, now I see it. <laughs> oh, why? Oh, my gosh. Okay. <laughs> These puzzles are getting so ridiculous. Well, you know what? Let's see what that looks like. So I'm going to take that picture. I'm going to go put it into code. So after this, all of those tests we ran, all of everything that was said by, well not everything, but most of the things that were said by Ben and, uh, and Alan are, uh, were all posted in a GitHub gist, which you can go see in the description. We found out in the future, we should have been using an issue instead of a gist, but you can check out 
all of those tests and all of that, and afterwards, a bunch of really dedicated individuals, people like Mobius Horizon, Horizons and Cali B and uh, Daniel, uh, oh gosh, what was his name? Daniel Week, W E, I'm sorry, I'm butchering your name. And uh, a bunch of other people got together and just poured through the data. People including like Z Manthu and, uh, and just, they, they just dug through the data and did everything they could to try to figure out what all of these packets mean with tons of analysis. And at the end, we figured it out. In addition, Ben was nice enough to go straight up tell us if we got it right. But thanks, Ben, and thanks, Alan. This has been one serious adventure. So now, let's take a look at that protocol. So first of all, let's talk about what kinds of data we'll actually be encoding. Though the, uh, the Watchmen handset, I totally can't draw, but that's probably okay, has things like uh, uh, analog, trigger, has buttons, touch, and an IMU, that's not what sucks up a lot of this bandwidth. Instead, it's those little dimples that are located all around it that get a trigger whenever there's a flash of light from the lighthouse, or the lighthouse sweeps it with a, a ray of, uh, rather, a plane of light. Now, we need to know exactly when each of those things are hit to uh, within one forty-eight millionth of a second and for how long they were hit. So for things like the, uh, the regular uh, HMD, the, the head mount display, it's covered in them and all that, that's easy because it's connected by USB 2.0. So what, what it actually sends back are these messages and these messages are split into several parts. One is the time the time in which it happened to within 148 millionth of a second, the length of the pulse that, that the pulse was you know, on for, a code indicating just like uh, what it is that it was a regular pulse, and which um, ID, what was the ID of the, the dot that was received. Now if you plug the watchman in, the little connector thing, then it gives you it in a format that's a little bit like that. Um, I think it just doesn't have the code or something like that. Um, but uh, either way, it doesn't do that wirelessly because wirelessly it's got to send that back to the HMD and then that has to come up the pipe and that's apparently a limited pipe. So Ben had to take these big messages and compress them down into something really small. So if I were to take the data, and I just tried this, for 12 seconds from one of the watchmen, uh, it takes about one megabyte to store for 12 seconds. If I u then use gzip-9 to compress it, which is one of the best compression algorithms I'm aware of, I mean there are others that are marginally better, but not much, uh, this really amazing compression algorithm only compresses that to about 98 kilobytes which you might be saying, wow, 10 to 1 ratio of compression, that's amazing. And yes, it is, the modern marvel of, of good file compression. But instead, if we don't use gzip-9, but we use Ben and his magical, wondrous protocol, it actually gets it all the way down to 69 kilobytes. That's amazing. Let's see a little bit about how. So inside of these messages, there is a, a first part which might contain some things like the trigger or buttons or an IMU or something, but um, we don't really worry about that part because they actually get pulled off one at a time. There's also a, a MSB for time and a few other things, um, but those all get pulled off. So we don't really know that much about, we don't really care where that comes from. But this also tells us the size of the overall packet. And we care about that because we need to know how many bytes are actually in this part of the payload. The light data payload. Now the light data payload, all we actually know is size. We don't know anything about the arrangement of the data in there or anything. So what we actually start with is at the end, they have only three bytes. 
that store the LSBs for the actual time. Um, so these store the, uh, the time. Remember how we stored it as four bytes before? That fills out these three. And we can do some trickery to kind of pull the first one from the front and find out if it, um, if it actually matches up right. Um, and then maybe increment or decrement it if we need to. And what this tells us is the time of, of last event within that packet. Now, what we actually have here is uh, a packet that tells us about events. So if we have a light that goes high, low, high, low, high, low, this could be light three, four, five, or something like that. Um, then we would record this event, this event, this event, this event, this event, and this event. Um, but since we know this is the end of the packet, we don't need to include that. Um, so Ben just saves a few bytes right there. Um, and so we have this time, and that points to right there, and then we store the difference between this time and this time, and 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 this time and this time. And by storing the difference, these numbers are smaller. And you'll see why it matters that numbers are smaller. When we're reading the data from the packet, that, that really does matter. Because in the beginning of the packet, we have the IDs of which LED is on. And then at the end of the packet, we have, of course, our time. But then we have those deltas that are stacked this way. And they meet in the middle. And they actually meet in a really convenient way. Because we know, based on how many LEDs that we have happen here, we're able to know exactly how many deltas to expect. And so what we have to do is start popping the deltas off the back until the number of bytes left going this way matches up with that and we're right in the middle. Conveniently, there's no ambiguous situations with this. It'll just always work out. Now I said it matters that the deltas are small. Let's see why. So if I only need to represent a number between 0 and 127, which is common for a sweep, then we can encode that with one byte. The way we do that is simply by writing it as the number and then setting a 1 in the most significant bit. So 0xff is actually equal to 0x7f uh, because the 1 bit just means that we're done. So what we can actually do if we want to represent a bigger number is we start writing it. Um, so say I want to represent something that's uh, 128. So then we split that up into two, bar two parts. The first one, we put the 0 there and a 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And then because we see the 0 there, we know we have to keep reading to the next packet. Put a 1 there and 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. And so that would be encoded as 0x810x00. Um, and so the idea is we just keep reading these packets and we keep concatenating these lower parts of the, the byte until we see a 1 in the MSB and that way we know we have a value. So that way instead of spending two bytes on every single time like we did under the normal protocol we only have to spend one almost all the time. In addition to this uh, we can then like read it from the back and we can keep track of where we are and then when we start popping off the IDs from the front we will just meet in the middle. Now, the IDs from the front are their own little complicated world because, uh, well, there are other situations that you can run into. What if it's not this simple one LED on and one LED off um, kind of thing? That's time. What if that's LED 8, 9, and 10? Well, that's easy because, you know, you just start back here and that's the start and then that's the delta and then it's off for a bit then it's you know on there and off there. So what they do is instead of storing the IDs is just which LED it is, it's actually split into two parts. This one byte is split into an upper part and a lower part. The lower part has three bits and the upper part has five bits. Now by having that split we can actually uh, we can encode a little bit more information. 
what we can say is we can start uh, at the, the end of time, back here, and we can, we can read a value. We can just uh, read the, the current time. And we get that from the end of the packet. And then we'll go look at this guy right here, this packet. And so we know that this very first byte um, coming off the front, we know that that's the end time. But we don't know when its start time is. So if it has a value here of zero, we know that the start time is the next edge. If it's a one, then it's actually this next edge right here. So it would extend out. And if it is a one, then, well, we have an unaccounted edge here. Now, that really matters because now when we read the next byte down there, because that's the next unaccounted edge, that's where that next byte starts. And it'll terminate wherever we, we need it to enter, to end. Now, by encoding all of the, the things this way, we can then get this to the absolute optimal way. Uh, I just cannot fathom any more optimal way to do it. Um, if you do run out of these codes here, like if there's too many bytes in a single thing, Ben just simply splits it off into the next packet. One of the other relatively clever things that he did that threw us for a loop for a while was if you're during a sweep, whoo, by it's going by, who cares? Or sound a sweep, sorry. I mean a big flash. If you have a big flash and the little guy gets all of those things lit up at once, well, Ben knows this and he's like, you know what? All that I really care about is just sending you these three because that's enough stuff to rebuild. Sorry. Rebuild the flash time. And uh, one other note, uh, this doesn't even go into that whole one megabyte down to 69 kilobytes. This is its own thing. This isn't even counted in the one kilobyte. So on top of all of this crazy compression, Ben has even found things that he doesn't even need to tell us about. So I just, this is just insane. There's so much to be learned here for trying to get protocols to get them really, really tiny. So I hope you guys learned something here. If you want to learn more about this protocol or the things that go into it, or just check it out, totally check out our GitHub gist. And, uh, and uh, hopefully I'll get some more projects out with uh, Live Survive, the thing that has started this whole thing. Um, if I'm lucky, it might be able to live stream again soon. Uh, and don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube, and you'll be notified about the live streams. Thank you.